We'd like to thank our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, the EMD Serono Pfizer Partnership, Fairgene, Genentech, Merck, and Urogen for their support of our Patient Insight webinar series. My name is Stephanie Chisholm, and I'm the Director of Education and Research here at Beacon. While the majority of bladder cancer cases, um, your epithelial cells are found in other parts excuse me, while well, the majority of bladder cancer is found in the bladder itself, urothelial cancer cells are found in other parts of the urinary tract. And today we're going to talk a little bit about a rarer form of bladder cancer, upper tract urothelial carcinoma. And it happens about five to 7%. And the doctors are going to give you a really good insight into how it's diagnosed, how it's treated, and what your options are. I'm really pleased to be joined by a panel of experts from across the country to discuss all of those aspects on this particular form of bladder cancer, upper tract urothelial carcinoma. We're joined first by our panelists and our moderator, Dr. Gary Steinberg from NYU Langone Health. Dr. Steinberg, would you like to say hello? Hello, and I'm thrilled that we're doing this again. Uh, it's something that I'm hoping that we'll do uh, more than uh, at least once a year, if not, if not uh, uh, once every other year. But this is a very important topic that uh, uh, dovetails nicely into urothelial cancer of the bladder, but is, is not necessarily the same. I, I think it's more like a, a cousin uh, of urothelial cancer of the bladder, but, but uh, uh, certainly a lot of similarities and something that is very important mm -hmm. to uh, Beacon. Great. So our panelists include Dr. Ahmad Sabzig from The Ohio State University, Dr. Alan Weiser from the University of Michigan, Dr. Seth Lerner from Baylor College of Medicine, Dr. Jennifer Linehan from the John Wayne Cancer Institute, Dr. Serena Matin from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and Dr. Monty Paul from City of Hope. You all have received a link to their short bios listing their expertise and any disclosures related to work that they do for pharmaceutical companies has also been emailed to you. So I'm gonna turn the screen over. Dr. Sobsik, if you'd like to share your video, I am going to give you remote control and you may start your slides. Well, thank I'm you. Pop um, off the video. Great. Thank you. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to do this again. Uh, it has been a while since we did it, uh, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'm happy to join uh, uh, our friends and uh, panel of experts. For my part of this, I'm going to go over the natural history, the definition of what's new to you see upper tract urethral carcinoma. And how is it? Uh, how does it resemble bladder cancer and what are the differences between the two and what kind of challenges uh, pay our patients and the physicians have in managing this disease. There you go. All right, so upper tract urethral carcinoma is a disease that includes um, cancers that develop in the pelvis of the kidney in the ureter, the tubes that connect the kidney all the way to the bladder. So lower tract urinary arterial carcinoma is what we usually call when it affects the bladder and the urethra, and upper tract is on top of the bladder, the ureters on both sides and the pelvis of the kidney. This is a rare kind of disease. It's around five to 7%, as was mentioned before, compared to the vast majority of urethral carcinoma happening in the bladder itself. So is it kidney cancer? We get that question quite a lot. Well, it's not exactly. So there are two, uh, two main kind of cancers that starts in the kidney. One that starts in the parenchyma or the meat of the kidney, that's the functional part of the kidney. That's the part that makes urine get rid of extra fluid in the body, uh, electrolytes, toxic materials, all kinds of stuff, make the urines. And this parenchyma dumps the urine into the pelvis of the kidney and the urine goes, goes down through the ureter. So there are cancers that happen in, from and originate from the parenchyma, the meat of the kidney. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the cancer that starts in the pelvis or the ureter. So is it kidney cancer? Not exactly, but can it be like, you know, in the kidney itself, in the pelvis of the kidney? Yes, it can. How common is this? Again, it's very rare. It's account for 5% of all new cancers in the United States. It's 81,000 new cases for bladder, can uh, for bladder cancer. On the other hand, bladder cancer has around 17,000 deaths. Now, out of all these cases, 
upper tract urethral carcinoma is around five to seven thousand cases. Um, it's more common uh, uh, in uh, men. Uh, in, in, uh, men. Uh, the women incidence and death have decreased over time. On the other hand, the incidence in men decreased, but the death stabilized over a, few, a couple of years now. The average age for our patient with upper tract urethral carcinoma is 73 years. 3% uh, involves both ureters when they're diagnosed and 17% concurrent with bladder cancer. In other words, 17% of patients who have upper tract urethral carcinoma, they are diagnosed at the same time when they're diagnosed with bladder cancer. Um, it is, uh, uh, when you look at it, it's interesting. So if a patient has already bladder cancer, depending on a lot of different uh, risk factors, they have around two to 4% chance that they can develop upper tract urethral carcinoma. On the other hand, uh, this uh, can be different if the patient has some risk factors such as prior carcinoma inside you. This is a more aggressive type of superficial non-invasive bladder cancer. On the other hand, if the patient had upper tract urethral carcinoma, the chance that they eventually will develop bladder cancer is much higher. And depending on what study you read, it's between 20, 22% to 47%. The question that comes again is, is it like bladder cancer? Where, yes and no. There are a lot of similar uh, uh, characteristics and features between the two diseases. They have very similar presentations. There are a lot of risk factors that are shared between the two. And under the microscope, they look alike most of the times. On the other hand, we do know that uh, genetically, they're not completely the same. There are slightly different genes and different genes percentages that changes, uh, ch gene changes percentages between the two diseases. What's also important to understand is the fact that diagnosing and staging or correctly staging UTC is much more difficult. In addition to that, treating upper tract urethral carcinoma has its own challenges, and it's sometimes it's more difficult to do than bladder cancer. The most common symptoms for the disease is blood in the urine. It's either, either something that's seen by our patients, they come complaining that they see blood in the urine, or sometimes they are found on urine analysis, urine testing. Uh, some patients will develop flank pain or back pain. And in rare cases, especially now with more imaging studies being done, it's very unusual for us to feel a mass, but sometimes in thin patients, you can feel that. If the patient has metastatic disease, in other words, the cancer has spread from the ureter or the pelvis of the kidney to somewhere else, they have symptoms of metastatic disease that includes loss of appetite, weight loss, fatigue, fevers, even night sweats. What are the risk factors? Just like bladder cancer, tobacco is the most common cause of upper tract urethral carcinoma. In addition to that, exposure to certain chemicals, being from a certain part of the wor uh, world and uh, you know, having you know, uh, some genetic changes and familiar diseases can expose you uh, to uh, upper tract urethral carcinoma. Um, there are some also chemicals that can exist in water and rare cases can be linked to the disease. For example, one of the most common syndromes or genetic changes that runs in family that can cause this rare disease is Lynch syndrome. Uh, it's one of the most common, if not the most common, inherited cancer syndrome. It includes a lot of, a lot of different diseases, and upper tract urethral carcinoma is one of them. Uh, tw as many as 21% of upper tract urethral carcinoma may have actually Lynch syndrome. And it depends what study you, uh, you read, there's actually th some th thoughts that some of these genetic changes can be more prominent and more common in upper tract urethral carcinoma. Uh, the criteria to consider this changes a lot. The most common things is for women, uh, younger patients who have this disease, uh, if it's only in the ureter without bladder cancer or if there's bilateral disease, there are some uh, recommendations, some guidelines where they actually recommend testing every patient for this. Um, and it may be important to find out for the family and everyone else. Um, in this syndrome, there are a lot of other cancers that can come with it.
So how do we stage the disease? How do we find out? So the staging of the disease is similar to bladder cancer. It can be superficial, just like the, uh, on the right side. And that includes uh, disease that's in the lining of the uh, ure uh, ureter or uh, CIS, just like uh, what can happen in the bladder itself or down to stage one disease. And it can be also invasive disease where it goes into the muscle or outside the ureter to the tissue around it or invade other organs. But uh, usually if you look at non-invasive disease compared to invasive disease, it's around 50 and 50%. So the staging of the disease also can be related to what kind of pathology we can get. So again, these are pictures that show us exactly what are the stages. So this is the stage where it's only in the mucosa, a STA or a, a, a CIS, or it can be stage one where it's invaded into the first layer underneath the lining of the uh, ureter and the kidney pelvis, it's the lamina propria. In stage two, it's invasive into the muscle. Stage three, it goes to the fat or the kidney itself it, it, if it was in the arena pelvis. And finally, unfortunately, there is a small percentage of patients where the cancer is more aggressive and it's spread outside the pelvis of the kidney and goes to other organs such as lungs, lymph nodes, liver, even bones. So what kind of difficulties do we have in diagnosing the disease? The vast majority of this is related to uh, technical issues. It's, the ureter is very small, the lumen is tiny. And our ability to be able to go up the ureter is much better than before. We have flexible scopes that give us excellent access. However, we're still talking about very small amount of tissue that we can get when we do a biopsy. When we do the staging, we rely on a lot of different things. We rely on urine tests to look for cancer cells. That's called cytology. Sometimes we do genetic testing on the uh, urine itself if cytology wasn't conclusive or we are, if we are suspecting still that there's disease even with it, without seeing the disease for sure. Um, we do biopsies using instrument, different instruments. And in general, they give us very tiny, small specimen. These are the three most common ways to do biopsy. And sometimes we use laser to resect some of the tumor and take it out and send it to the pathologist. So this is a piranha biopsy, this is a big biopsy, and this is a basket that we use. Uh, in addition to that, we use imaging studies. Uh, IVP used to be used commonly in the United States, not anymore. We mostly use CD scan with special 3D reconstruction to see the renal pelvis and the ureter. Sometimes we use MRI, and there has been some studies of using ultrasound, but it hasn't panned out to be very useful at this point and it's not commonly used. What kind of treatments, difficulties we have? Well, it's difficult because it's difficult for us to know the stage of the disease. In addition to the fact that our patients are older in age, they have a lot of other medical problems. And uh, you know, sometimes we have to take the kidney out and that can impact their kidney function and can impact their quality of life. Um, in addition to that, we think about a lot of different factors that help us decide what kind of treatment, which will be covered by my colleagues, including the stage, the grade, the location, the number of the lesions. And with that, I will uh, uh, hand it over to my friend, uh, Dr. Weiser, to continue with the treatment options. And thank you.